Kate McBride. I'm the director of 350 Vermont, and we are really delighted to um, have the opportunity to have Starhawk here with us tonight. Um, yeah. Hurricane victims. There's a table downstairs in case you did get that information and someone will be here to collect those later. And then finally, I just wanted to say that we really hope that this event is something that will inspire you and connect you more to the climate movement here in Vermont and beyond. Um, 350 Vermont is a network of people all across the state that are working together in many ways um, in this movement for um, to try and reverse the, the crisis that we're in. Uh, a couple things coming up is that we have um, our annual gathering, uh, annual convergence, and that will be November 4th at Goddard, not too far from here. Yeah. And, uh, and also keep an eye out very soon for um, bank actions. We are going to be responding to a call from indigenous leaders in the Pacific Northwest who are calling for an action against the banks that are funding the desecration of Mother Earth. And so we invite you to take part in that on October 23rd in many different locations in the state, I think. More on that soon. And without further ado, I'd like to bring up, ask Ruby to come up for an introduction. Star on. And what I have are three little snapshots. Don't worry, they're verbal snapshots, but I'm going to describe them for you. The first snapshot in this picture, you see Starhawk laboring up a steep wooded hillside. The trail is crisscrossed with roots, so hard to navigate, even if she were not on the crutches, which she is. She is leading a group of about 20 people who have come to the south of France to explore the Paleo Paleolithic cave art deep inside the limestone hills that she is now climbing. Her attention is concentrated, focused on this task. Days before the start of this trip, that was planned a year before, she broke her ankle. Is it too loud? Thank you. Uh, what you can't see is that she came off the airplane in a wheelchair carrying a set of crutches that she had not yet learned to use. <laughs> Another person might have canceled the trip, but Starhawk not only got on the plane as planned and learned how to use the crutches while leading a group, she also chose to descend this steep hill on crutches knowing that she would have to climb back up fully under her own power. I chose this picture because I think it says something about that power. It is not a picture of strength, though there is muscle power, mostly in determination. It is certainly not a picture of Protestant work ethic. It is about a clarity of purpose and commitment over the long haul. This picture tells you something about a purposefulness that has become a habit of body, an embodied way of being in the world that may be necessary to navigate a world that is evolving daily with each decision we make. Mm. Picture number two. <laughs> this... <laughs> Are you blushing yet? No. Good. <laughs> this is a picture taken at a recent EAT, Earth Activist Training. Uh -huh. It shows Starhawk and her teaching partner, Charles, who is here standing in front of a whiteboard with a scribble of notes and drawings about the role of mycelium in the biology of plants and the water flow of patterns. People have come to this place in southern Illinois for a two-week intensive training to learn about permaculture, but they end up understanding the implications of loving Earth. They will leave, inevitably, with dirt under their fingernails. It is the end of the second day of the course, and what you can't tell in the photo is that it's raining very hard outside. Mm -hmm. It had started with the evening session and continued throughout the principles of permaculture. The sky had cleared and the night seemed calm as the students left, anticipating an evening around the fire circle in the meadow where they had pitched their tents. 
Their valuables, computers and cameras, etc., were locked in their cars parked nearby. What is outside the view of this picture is just now being discovered by the students is that a flash flood has arisen and water is now soaking their tents and bedding, inundating their cars halfway up the doors. <laughs> Suddenly, everything has changed and the situation has its own demands, imperatives that won't be ignored. We could say that this is a picture about teachable moments <laughs> or about the best laid plans gone awry, but really, it is a picture of students staying steady when everything is in flux, of Starhawk and Charles holding the center in the rising pandemonium of climate change, about guiding the precarious work of caring for each other, collectivizing the losses, inventing keys, and generally embracing whatever comes. It's really about trust, trusting ourselves and each other, and ultimately, our place in the world. The third picture is a picture of a spiral dance. <laughs> it's in a densely populated area. It could be anywhere, Seattle, a bridge in Quebec City, Washington Square, Grand Central Station, Lafayette Park, Genoa, Italy, anywhere activists have come to their public spaces en masse. There are usually cops surrounding the area, or they will arrive soon in full riot gear. You cannot distinguish individual faces. You can only see a slowly revolving but disorderly crowd of people. Starhawk is in the center. She's playing a simple beat on a small dubek, her head lifted high, watching all around her, walking in ancient pattern, step by step, spiraling the chaos into order. This picture isn't about taking control, though sometimes it may seem that a strong voice or a clear vision is how to get a desperate group to cohere. This picture is about reaching into the chaos, offering your hand to the unknown while walking deeply grounded and steadily on the earth. It is about the kind of power that has to do with being comfortable with not knowing what the hell you're doing or where you're going at any given point, while trusting the creative dynamics at work in our world. In fact, it is about holding power and embodying that power to do, to do the work that needs done. So this is a little bit of an introduction to Starhawk, and I will let you reveal more. Let her reveal more. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Ruby, I was sure you were going to talk about the spiral dance uh, in Quebec City, protesting the FTAA up at the barricades, where you, I caught your eye across the spiral as tear gas canisters were flying above us. <laughs> there are many ways to do a spiral dance, but hello, everybody. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm really grateful to Jen and everyone from 350.org for inviting me. Uh, when Jen and I were talking about this, we were talking about doing an interactive workshop. Um, and then I think more and more people started signing up for it. So we're still going to do an interactive workshop, um, but we are going to do an interactive workshop with a whole lot of people in a somewhat non-interactive space in a very short time. So here we go. We'll see what happens. Uh, I've done a lot of different things in my life, as Ruby's introduction might give you a hint of, uh, from being an activist to being a ritual maker, uh, to being a permaculture designer and teacher, to being a writer and an author. And all of them, except sometimes being a writer, have involved collaboration with other people, working in groups with other people. I think our ability to work together effectively in groups is kind of like our big constraining factor when it comes to changing the world. You know how in ecology or ecological design, you're always looking at something and saying, well, what's the constraining factor here? Uh, where I live, out uh, in the West Coast, the constraining factor often is 
summertime water. Um, in other places, it might be sunshine, or it might be soil, or it might be wintertime cold. Um, but that's, you know, it's the most extreme thing that you have to take into account. And I think for a lot of our groups and our movements, our sheer ability to work together and get along and resolve conflict and deal with conflict is the limiting factor in what we can accomplish. So a number of years ago, I ended up writing a book called The Empowerment Manual, Guide for Collaborative Groups because I wanted to think better about how we can work together. And I felt like if we can improve the effectiveness of the groups that we're in, we can improve the effectiveness of every single thing that we're doing to bring about change. So um, I'm gonna start out by recognizing that uh, we stand here on land that is the traditional land, I believe, of the uh, um, Western Abenaki people. Do I have that right? Yeah. And of other tribes, maybe going back further, whose names we may not know. Uh, and that our connection to this land uh, really comes from with uh, the grace of those ancestors and those people. Uh, and to start with honoring that and with a moment of gratitude for all the work of all the people done through all the ages to protect and care for and honor the land. Um, hopefully as we do our work around climate change and around other issues, we can see ourselves as part of that long tradition of care and guardianship for the land and for the waters and for all those sacred elements that sustain our lives. We, we also, when we work together in groups, the unfortunate thing is we have to actually work with other people. <laughs> and people are notoriously difficult to get along with um, because they don't all agree with me, and they all have their own uh, identities and their own goals and their own visions and their own ideas about how they do things. Uh, so I want to start by thinking a little bit about what our identities are, who we are. Uh, if we were a smaller group, I'd have us all introduce ourselves to each other. Uh, if we were to do that in this group, that would take the entire night. But I am going to have you introduce yourself to someone. And also just to say, because we're such a big group, I'm not gonna have a formal break in the middle of this, because if we did, it would take 45 minutes to get back. Um, but I will, please, if you need to go to the bathroom, uh, if you need to get water, if you need a bite to eat or whatever, feel free to wander out and take care of yourself. So, um, a couple of years ago, I was at a conference and I heard uh, an Ohalone Indian man from California, where I live, speaking. His name is Greg Castro. And he was talking about what it meant to be a California Indian. And he said, if you're a California Indian, your identity is your place. For most of us, maybe our identity is, maybe it is, you know, how many of you identify as Vermonters? <laughs> okay. I identify, I have to admit, more as a Californian, but I do see the appeal and the beauty of Vermont. It's a beautiful, beautiful state. Um, but nonetheless, our identity isn't quite the same as it would be if um, that was where our ancestors had lived for 10,000 years. Maybe for some of you it is, but probably for most of us, our ancestors come from some other place. You know, many indigenous cultures, your identity is your tribe, or it might be your clan within that tribe. Uh, I think for a lot of us, our identity is connected often to our work, what we do in the world, or to what our role is in the family come from. We 
a parent or a daughter or a son or a sister, wife, husband, uh, lover, partner, some sort. Um, for some people it might be your gender identity or the pronoun that you choose to uh, use to identify yourself. Uh, for some of us it might be a race or it might be an ethnicity. Uh, it might be, um, for some people it might be the car that you drive. It might be whether you're a Mac or a PC user or the sports team you support. <laughs> So what I'd like you to do is find someone here that you don't know yet and take a few minutes, just about five minutes all together and share a little bit about how you uh, think of your identity, the various facets and aspects of it. constantly to identify ourselves. Uh, some of it comes out of the necessity of identity politics. You know, when we live in a world where something like your racial identity can be a matter of life or death, it's hard to escape those identities. Um, we're still in a world where your gender identity has a huge impact that goes beyond uh, so many of the things that we would like it to go beyond. But I think it's always important to remember when we get together in groups that identity is really a full and rich and a complex thing. And I think one thing that is the mark of a healthy group is when we have an agreement that this is a place where we want everyone to be able to show up and be seen and appreciated in the fullness of who they are, uh, so that we don't erase anyone's identity, uh, but we also know you are not any one aspect of your identity. You may be many, many, many different complex things. Um, and I think that's one of the ways we start to undo the stereotypes and the prejudices, and one of the ways that we can begin to build rich and full human relationships across some of those barriers that can divide us. Are you ready to play a game? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's stand up for a moment. All right. Go ahead. Okay. So we, um, we can move out and fill this space a little bit, but the way this game works is 
Uh, it comes from the world of improvisation. If we're doing an improv, if we're doing a scene in an improv, I might kind of make a suggestion to somebody. So I might do something like, if he takes my suggestion and builds on it, it's like he's saying yes to it. So I don't know if you can see him, but he took my imaginary apple and started to eat it, right? So the way this works is anyone can make a suggestion. Anyone can say something like, let's all pick apples and then everyone says yes let's all pick apples <laughs> try that yes, yes let's all pick apples and then we pick apples until the next person makes a suggestion so it's open now <laughs> anyone can make suggestions let's all juggle apples, let's yes. all juggle apples. <laughs> Yes, let's polish our apples. Let's go swimming. Yes, let's go swimming. Yes, let's overthrow the patriarchy. Yes, let's overthrow the patriarchy. Yes, effective group you know when you're in a group where you feel like your suggestions can be heard uh, where people are kind of cheering you on and willing to go with ideas and willing to have fun with them then I think that's a group that people want to be in and I think it's a group that works together more effectively of course when you're actually working on a project you're not necessarily always saying yes let's all to every suggestion but there's a way in which you can be energetically supporting people for their suggestions, even if you might have questions or you might have other ideas. Um, but also, even within that uh, silly game, I think things come up that are also models of what happens in groups. So let me ask, how many people made suggestions? And, you know, that's not very many people compared to how many people are here in the group. Um, part of that was a factor of time. Um, but that factor of time always exists in groups. Uh, that even though in some ways that game sets up an equal field for participation, in reality the people who made suggestions uh, were the people who jumped in early and made suggestions. How did it feel to make a suggestion and have your suggestion taken up by the group? Anyone want to speak to that? Affirming. What? Affirming. Affirming. Surprise. surprise? What, can you tell me more about the surprise? I suggested hugging somebody and I was feeling a need to connect other than just talking. 
And anyone make a suggestion that the group didn't take up? So again, even though in some ways this was an equal field, in reality, it really helped to have a loud voice. <laughs> if you had a softer voice, you ran the risk that you wouldn't actually be heard. Um, yeah. They made suggestions or their suggestions were heard. So yeah, so there was a kind of like unspoken bias toward people who were in the front of the room versus people who were in the back of the room. How many people didn't make suggestions? Hmm. How'd that feel? Anyone feel good about it? Yeah. I'm the kind of person that thinks before I say anything, and it is, you can't think. Uh -huh. you know, so if you get people that are quieter, everybody else is worked out stuff, gets their stuff out, and you're sitting here going, and again, I think that's also something that happens in groups often when we might say we want equal participation, but some people might take longer to, you know, might need longer to think of something, might need, might process at a different speed, or even just talk at a different speed. Um, and we had someone in our group who drove everyone crazy because she talked really slowly all the time. Uh, she was originally from Texas. We were all in California. Um, you know, one year we all went back to Texas to teach a workshop, and suddenly we were in a place where everyone talked really slowly all the time. <laughs> and she fit, and we seemed like we were just racing along. Like, <laughs> So uh, sometimes being conscious, what are some of these invisible barriers? You know, what are some of the things we might not even be aware of that are actually impacting participation? Somebody who is maybe more sensitive or conscious about, uh, oh, how is this going to impact other people? Might be more hesitant to put a suggestion in. Um, Anyone want to make a suggestion and not get to make it? Yeah? You want to say what yours was? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I was going to say, let's all paint abstract art. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to know, too. Like you said, people are in front and they speak really loud. So, um, anyone think of a suggestion and then decide for yourself that you weren't going to make it for some reason? Yes? I was going to say, let's smash capitalism, but uh, I was afraid that the people used to get mad at me because they wanted to smash. <laughs> <laughs> and also the So, uh, you know, many levels, again, in which even in a field where it's open and supportive, there might be reasons why people might censor themselves. They might have their own fears going on. I saw one hand back there also. I think my, my first reaction was, let's throw our apples at Gino. <laughs> again, I think I was concerned about the police, you know, that the violent mm -hmm. So sometimes we might censor ourselves out of fear of being judged. Uh, sometimes we might censor ourselves, you know, some of us might have come up with ideas that fleetingly cross your mind and you kind of go, that's not really appropriate and maybe some of them might not have been appropriate. I don't know. <laughs> um, one more hand here. So, you know, groups always work in multiple ways. Oftentimes when groups work through rules, through agreements, through things that are overt and explicit. I stand up there too long, I'll start to feel like a preacher. <laughs> um, you know, our agreement was anyone can make a suggestion and we'll all say yes, let's all, and we'll do it. Um, 
but groups also have implicit biases and groups also work through norms and norms are things that are not explicitly agreed on um, and yet can be more powerful sometimes than those explicit rules. Uh, the example I always think of is the time I went to the anarchist book fair in San Francisco directly from our pagan spring equinox ritual and I forgot to change clothes. <laughs> So I arrived dressed all in beautiful, flowing, emerald green <laughs> flowers, and every single other person in that book fair was dressed in black. <laughs> there was not, I mean, there might have been a little red or a little gray, but there was not another color anywhere. And it was an amazingly uncomfortable experience. I, was tempted to run out and change, and then I thought, no, this is like an, you know, an unexpected psychological experiment. <laughs> I should stay there and observe, you know, how its impact on me. <laughs> uh, nobody was mean to me. Nobody sneered. Nobody came up and said, Starhawk, you just didn't get the message, did you, out the dress code? You know. But I felt so uncomfortable. It was a great learning about how it must feel often to be like the one person of color in a white group, or uh, the one woman in a men's group, or the one man in a woman's group. Even if people are welcoming and friendly, some little piece deep inside you says, like, this is actually not for people like me. How come I didn't get the message? And, um, you know, it was also interesting because wearing black, you know, that was no rule. If they had made a rule, you know, if they had sent out a directive and said, anarchists, you will not be admitted unless you wear black, all the anarchists would have rebelled. Right? <laughs> there would have been marches and sit-ins with rainbow flags and saying, like, don't take our colors. You know, right? Um, but because it wasn't a rule, it was just a norm, every single other of the four or five hundred people there woke up that morning and went, going to the anarchist book fair, putting on black, right? <laughs> and somehow I did not get the message. So what I'd like you to do is think a little bit about some of the groups that you've been in, in your life. and. Um, where have you been in groups that had norms or rules that explicitly invited participation and brought you in? And where have you experienced norms or rules that maybe excluded you or made you feel unwelcome in some way, consciously or unconsciously? So um, you can find you know, if you're here with people from the same group, you might want to talk about your group and think about what some of your norms and rules are. Um, if you're not, you might pick some people again that you may or may not know. Um, but we'll have a few minutes, maybe about five minutes, to think about this. Yeah, so groups of three or four.
sorry that you know the constraints of time make it impossible for everyone to get heard or get to make comments, but I'd be interested to hear a few examples if people have norms that either included people, brought them in, or that maybe subtly excluded people, kept them out. A member of our local rotary, um, they've been trying to get me to come in for years and years, and I finally said yes, I've been with them for about a year now. Um, but they start every meeting with a uh, pledge of allegiance, which I have not done since seventh grade. Um, I stand at attention, but I ever suggest I go more to or refuse to do the pledge of allegiance. And they also, the second thing is a prayer that always starts our Father, and I'm a pagan. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I'm the only pagan. Uh, and I was very lucky to ask to do the prayer last week, which I started with Paul and his whole meeting to us. Thank you. That's a great example. Uh, I had a few examples. Um, there's one group that I belong to that encourages everyone to take on leadership, yet there is leadership that is sort of designated who decides who's ready to take on leadership. So it's kind of a funny mix. And I mean, it's, on the one hand, it has encouraged a lot more leadership than I usually would think would happen. But, um, but there's still a little bit of a feeling that there's a lid on the pot. Um, and then another thought is, I work in the soil health, soil carbon movement, and um, on the coasts, we make an assumption that anyone who's interested in soil or in the environment is um, either a Democrat or progressive or politically left. <laughs> and most of the people I work with in the middle of the country are, you know, not most, but many, at least half, I would say, are Republican, conservative Christians who are very, very, uh, progressive in their approach to environmental work. Mm. And um, and I feel like there's a funny norm here on the coast about what that means. Thank you. I'm scent free, gluten free, dairy free, <laughs> soy free, and egg free. Oh. <laughs> Because also, you know, I think one thing that happens is when there is a norm that excludes you, like if somebody's wearing their favorite perfume, that might make it impossible for you to be there. But if you're always the one that has to challenge that and bring that up, that gets to be exhausting and it gets to be a burden. See one up here? Hello. extensive and deep, and uh, they often impact us in ways we're not even conscious of. And I think when somebody threatens those norms, just even by who they are and how they present, uh, it can make people deeply uncomfortable. And uh, it is exhausting to constantly be around people that are being made deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> So that's why we often say in the movement, you know, one of the things we can do to be helpful allies is, you know, not to leave it to the person who represents the oppressed group to be the one to think about those things, but uh, to bring them up and to name them and identify them. Um, but I will say this, there's often a thing that we say that says, um, 
you know, we sh women shouldn't have to educate men on these things. Black people shouldn't have to educate white people. Transgender people shouldn't have to educate cis people. And I think it's true, we shouldn't have to because of that exhaustion. But on the other hand, I feel like we're in a moment right now where we actually might want to. <laughs> because for one thing, like, if you don't, you know, they might just go scroll around the internet and God us only knows what they're going to come up with. <laughs> Uh, you might want to, at times, we might want to think about our movements as educational fields and make sure that maybe if it's not, maybe you're not the one that has to do all that education, but that we as a group hold the knowledge and the education so that we can do it, so that when someone comes in, they are educated in an enriching and a deep and a, um, a full way. Um, because I think a lot of what's happening now is people are getting educated by scrolling around Facebook and reading various things and often getting very badly educated about all these things. We have one more. And while that's happening, we might bring up the image. There are two things that I've experienced in groups. Uh, one is a group that's you know, doing whatever actions. Do we get together to talk about things? We have a check-in where everybody tells something about themselves. It has nothing to do with the subject we come together. We don't get out of business we listen to each other first. That makes me feel included and it makes me feel connected to hearing what everybody else says. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very inclusive step, not just the business of each other, but the yeah. activity of being. The other thing is on the other side is where uh, some people quite often say, well, we decided, and there are groups this week, we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of like the royal we I just so excluded if somebody says we, and I wasn't around, or we didn't even discuss it as we just mm -hmm. Thank you, those are great examples, and yeah, I love that tradition of the check-in because it's a way of really demonstrating like we do care about you as a whole person, not just as, you know, the uh, person in charge of the food table at the event, but, you know, we care about all those aspects of your life and it helps to build relationships that make groups stronger and more connected. So, um, up here, <laughs> I have something I came up with when I was thinking about what are there patterns we can look at? What, you know, how can we identify what makes a group functional and what makes a group dysfunctional? And one of the patterns I like a lot is that pattern of the mandala, the magic circle with the four elements and the four directions. Uh, it's one we use a lot in my magical, spiritual tradition. Uh, it's one that's common to many, many indigenous cultures and traditions. I think because it's a pattern of wholeness. And I like it also because it kind of gets us out of some of the binaries that we think of. You know, a lot of people will divide the world and talk about traits being masculine or feminine. And um, there's just many, many ways in which that can get problematic. Um, but I think if we think about traits as being fire or water or earth or air, uh, that gets us out of that binary and allows us to look at different and more complex ways that things can balance. So this is a map. It's not like a reality or a dogma. <laughs> But I think it's, it can be a useful lens for seeing things. And uh, there's a friend of mine named Adam Walpert who lives and works in a community called Occidental Arts and Ecology Center in California, in Sonoma County. And he was giving us a talk one day about intentional communities. And he said he felt what made for a healthy community was a balance between power and responsibility. So that when people gain power, uh, they did it by taking on responsibility. Um, anyone ever been in a group where people gain power in some other way? Yeah. How was that? Yeah. Okay. 
yeah, you know, sometimes in our groups people gain power by who they're friends with or because they have more money or, you know, for some extraneous reason, and that's not helpful to a group. Um, and the counterbalance to that is if people are given a responsibility, the group empowers them. The group gives them the power or the authority, which is the license to use power to carry it out. Anyone ever been in a situation where you had a responsibility and you weren't given the power you needed to carry it out? Yeah. And how was that? <laughs> so, <laughs> what? You can't read it? Let's see. What's on the axis? What's on the, oh, on the axis? I'll get to the axis, okay. Um, so can you read the, er, the power and responsibility part? Okay. 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 So the top it says earth, responsibility. The bottom it says fire and power. Um, the right side says air, which is accountability and communication. And on the other side says water and trust. And then the two axes in between, it's like if you get power and responsibility right, um, then you've kind of the axis between them, I think of as action. You can take action. And if you get trust and accountability and balance and communication, then that balance is the axis of learning. Because I think our communication is clearest and best if we think about it in the context of learning rather than the context of winning and losing, which we often do. So uh, I want to talk a little bit, especially right now, around power, because I think that's where groups often run into trouble. Uh, how many of you work in groups that consider themselves non-hierarchical in some way, horizontal? A lot of you. And how many of you work in groups that have some kind of hierarchy, some kind of clear lines of command? Okay. So it's about half and half. Right? Uh, and how many of you work sometimes in both? Because yeah. we, I think uh, most of us in our work lives, most of the institutions in our culture are set up on some kind of lines of power and authority. Uh, and oftentimes most of our voluntary groups are set up often in lines of, uh, that are more horizontal, more collaborative or collective. And um, I believe there is a place for hierarchy. You know, there are times when it really helps to have a clear chain of command. You know, do you want the fire department to pull up in front of your house when it's on fire? sit down and have a consensus meeting about who gets to hold the hose today, right? <laughs> no, I don't think so, right? Um, emergencies, things that need quick, directed, clear action, things that need training, you know. Um, do you want the hospital in Montpelier to open its doors and say, this is brain surgery Skillshare day? <laughs> You too can empower yourself to <laughs> know, right? There are things that we want people to be trained to do, and people really do have different levels of skill. How many of you are parents? You know, you, do you want to sit down with your two-year-old and say, oh, Janie, you know, let us have a discussion about uh, how I will not interfere with your inherent freedom when you want to run out to the middle of the freeway. You no, know, you want your two-year-old to survive, to grow up, and for that reason, power over sometimes, uh, you know, that power that we exert when one person exerts control over another or a situation or sets the terms or imposes constraints or punishments, Sometimes there's very benevolent and positive uses for that. Um, but a lot of times what happens in our culture is that, you know, somebody who might have 
the training and the skill and all of that to be the brain surgeon, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, she actually knows better than you do about what you should serve at your co-housing picnic. Yeah. Um, we don't necessarily want that status that is important in one area to carry over into other areas. And there are many areas in which it's important for people to have an equal say and an equal voice, uh, regardless of what their skill level might be in some other area. Um, you know, when we don't allow people to, when we won't, you know, when we don't empower people, sometimes I've been in groups that are so, you know, devoted to being egalitarian that they refuse to allow anyone to exercise power. You know, I'm thinking about some of the moments, any of you involved in the Occupy movement? You know, there were moments where uh, in San Francisco we had a media collective in our local Occupy. And the media collective was responsible for doing things like putting out press releases and talking to the media. But the group insisted that every press release had to be run through the General Assembly which, well, the General Assembly met at 6 o'clock every day, and things happened at all different times, and press releases needed to go out at all different times. And half the time when the General Assembly met, uh, the meetings were so long and ponderous, they never got around to looking at them. So the media collective was like in tears. <laughs> you know, how can I do my job if I'm not entrusted with the power to do it? So in order to empower people, we have to also be willing to invest some trust in them. Um, and in order to invest some trust, we need some clear communication. Uh, we need to be able to say to the media collective, you know, here's three core points we want you to make in every press release. You know, and here are some things we never want you to say in any press release. Uh, and here's how we can hold you accountable for and now you know what we've decided, now you go, and you are empowered to write those press releases, and we're not going to sit there and micromanage every sentence in every paragraph. Is that make, making sense to people? No. Um, yeah. I also think communication, you know, a, lot of, a friend of mine talks about the difference between um, speaking and thinking and listening to someone in order to hear and to learn and to understand their perspective versus listening in order to reload, <laughs> to, uh, to sort of work up your next little you know, shot that you're going to send. And I think if we think about communication often as learning, you know, my you know, if you and I are having a discussion about how we think the strategy should be for the climate movement. We might or might not agree, but if I can look at that and say, okay, I'm learning something about your perspective, rather than I have to win here, <laughs> then we have a more effective communication. Uh, so if we had much longer for this, we'd be able to go deeply into all of these things. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit more about power, because I think there are different kinds of power. So we've talked a little bit about power over, but there's also, if I were to say to you, where do you feel power in your life? Um, just call some things out, call them out loud. You won't have to take the microphone around. It's a gardener. What? Second the gardener. Second the gardener. Yeah. Together. Together. Choices. Choices. Art. What? Teaching. Cooking. Cooking. Right. Singing. Preaching. You know. What? Preaching. Preaching. Yeah. Connecting with nature. Puppets, okay. Where I don't feel power is I'm really deaf in one ear, and so it's hard to hear. Um, but what I'm hearing from everybody, you know, is 
closer to the root meaning of the word power, which is literally the Latin root means ability, to be able to do something. And the kind of power I'm hearing, you know, if somebody has, feels power in cooking, that doesn't take away my power to cook. In fact, that might nourish me. That might give me a new recipe. Um, power over kind of goes one way. You know, if I have the power to hire you and fire you, you probably don't have the power to fire me. Um, but if I have the power to sing, that doesn't take away any of your power to sing. And in fact, uh, we might sing together and have even more of a beautiful and powerful experience. So that kind of power from within, I think, is something we often try to nourish and nurture in our groups and to encourage in one another. Um, but there's also another kind of power that I think operates in all groups where human beings come together. Uh, and that we often confuse with power over with decision-making power. And that is what I would call social power. Um, and the differential in how much your voice is heard in a group, how much you get listened to. Uh, no matter how equal we like to think we are, uh, there's generally always some people whose voices get heard more easily than others. That might be because they're louder you know, in this situation. Um, that might be because they've earned that power by having a track record of making you know, good interventions in the group, of contributing and bringing things into the group. Um, it's what elder, you know, we call eldership in traditional cultures. Um, but that power sometimes can also be unearned. You know, it might be because someone happens to be good looking, or they happen to be the right skin color, the right gender, the right class background. Um, sometimes it can be a mix of both. You know, you might have be articulate, and maybe you've got a lot of education, and you had a lot of chance to develop that. Well, maybe you got that education because you worked really hard to do it. And you studied and you learned and you waited tables so you could put yourself through school. Um, or maybe you got that education because your grandfather went to that college and your grandmother went to that college and you were, you know, entered into it from birth and your parents paid for it and you skated your way through and um, barely passed all your tests. You know, it can be some of both. So, um, I think in healthy groups, they're groups where people have an opportunity to fairly earn social power. Um, if we don't ever let people earn any social power or any decision-making power in groups, they actually become very unfair and disempowering. And the people often who have the most, take on the most responsibility, the most commitment, burn out and leave. But at the same time, if that social power is distributed unfairly, uh, people get very frustrated and also leave. And the group becomes less intelligent, you know, less resilient. Um, if that social power also is so sucked up by you know, the person who's the founder of the group or the people who've been there forever and there's no room for any new people to gain any social power, then the group kind of rigidifies and generally uh, doesn't do very well. So I'd like to give you some time maybe to get together again with two or three other people and think about some of the groups you're in and think about are there differences in social power? And if so, how do people gain social power in those groups? Is it a fair way or are there unfair ways? Because those unfair ways are what we call privilege. And I think that's something we'd like to undo. Um, but those fair ways, I think, can be ways that groups can grow and become more resilient and stronger. So think about 
few more minutes, five, ten minutes. Um, again, take two or three other people.
uh, some of that experience and knowledge got lost from the group. So how do we change it if we see that something's operating unfairly? Did you have an example too? I see my hand up there. No. Um, what can we do to shift that or to change that? Yes, I mean, the first thing you can do is acknowledge it and talk about it and bring it out in the open because as soon as it's talked about in the open, it no longer is covert, it becomes overt, and then you can actually make choices and decisions about it. Um, the other thing I think that's helpful is if you get a group agreement that we want to change this norm or we want to change this um, you know, we want to change the way we allocate respect in this organization. Um, it's hard for one person alone to do that, but I've seen it done effectively, for example, in a group where on their internet listserv there had become this norm of people like arguing and attacking each other and taking their personal issues and sort of trying to, you know, work them out on a listserv where there were a hundred people all over the country, most of whom didn't know either of them. <laughs> and it was very ineffective and very destructive. And what happened was the group sort of talked about it and got an agreement so that it wasn't just one person saying, wait a minute, this is not appropriate for the listserv. Uh, it was one person and another person and another person saying, wait a minute, this is not an appropriate use of this listserv. Uh, the other part piece of that, though, is if something's going on, there's some way people are unfairly gaining social power, or unfairly imposing something that is not working for the group, maybe to take a step back and say, is this, uh, is this telling us some information? Uh, maybe people are putting this out in a forum that's not appropriate because there actually is no appropriate place to air these grievances or work things out. Uh, someone once said about one of our groups that they were like a, a body that lacked a liver. You know, a liver can move toxins out of the body and you know, if you're in a hierarchy, you know, you're in a family and uh, you and your brother are fighting, mom can come in and say, you two kids, stop fighting or I'm going to separate you. No ice cream, if you don't. But if you're in a non-hierarchy where everyone has equal authority and two people are fighting, there's no one who can come in and say, hey, you two, you know, you stop fighting or, you know, go outside and work out your issues. Uh, and often those issues can bounce around and bounce around and ultimately break a group apart. Diana Leaf Christian, who wrote the book on intentional communities, um, Creating a Life Together, says 90% of intentional communities fail, uh, which is a really tragic statistic, but mostly because of conflict. So I think it's important for us to learn these tools. Uh, again, if we had a much, much longer time, we could go more into conflict resolution and all of those things. Um, but I think I want to offer just two things about it right now. First is that I think we get in the worst conflicts when we try to avoid conflict. <laughs> Under, embrace conflict. Understand conflict is drama. Conflict is what, you know, if you look at what's on TV, the hundreds and hundreds of hours of things that are hour on TV and Netflix and Hulu and in the movies and, you know, on Amazon Prime and all of those things. All of them involve conflict, because without conflict, there's no drama. There's no excitement. There's nothing that keeps you interested. So if we stop thinking of conflict as destructive, start understanding, you know, in group, there's conflict when there's passion. 
again, if we're planning our next action for 350.org and I want to blockade the bank and you want to blockade the gas station, <laughs> we tend to frame our conflicts as good versus evil. But actually, many of our conflicts are what I think of as good versus good. Uh, there are two positive things or two things we might both hold the value in going and sort of targeting the financial institutions and we might both see the value in targeting the oil companies. It might be just a matter of which value we hold more strongly or which one we think is more urgent or more effective at this moment. So those conflicts can be about ideas or about priorities or about plans and not about personalities. You know, if I don't make you evil because you're on the oil company team, right, then I think um, our conflicts can be productive and can be exciting. See a hand. Validating those, the other person's value, what they're saying, you can validate that. It seems like you're opening the door for yourself. Yeah, so if you can validate what the other person is saying or is feeling or what the values that they hold, then in a way, she, what she said is you're opening the door for yourself. So, um, so if we think about conflict and embrace it, and if we think about conflict as, is this good versus good, not good versus evil? then I think we don't have to be so conflict averse and uh, we can uh, learn to do it effectively in our groups. Um, so the other thing that I think is important in our groups is thinking about values. Um, oftentimes, you know, we in political organizations, we tend to talk about strategy, we tend to talk about plans, we tend to talk about priorities, uh, we tend to assume a set of values. But I think our groups are strongest when we can actually articulate what our deep values are. And I think the right wing is actually better at doing this often than the left. Uh, they talk in terms of morality. Uh, their morality might be very different, say, than mine. You know, mine's less about what you do uh, in bed with somebody or who you do it with and a lot more of how you treat the earth and how you treat other people. Um, but they talk in those terms. They speak to people in terms of values. And they're not afraid of that language. And I think the left has often inherited this thing from Marxism where like, you know, we don't want to talk about the metaphysical or the religious or the spiritual or anything like that because that's the opiate of the people. You know, we want to appeal to people's reason and rationality. Um, but actually people are not that rational. <laughs> Even we are not that rational, you know think we're somewhat rational, but people are moved um, not so much by facts and statistics, but by stories and emotions and metaphors. Uh, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work of George Lakoff, the linguist. He's written a number of books. He's written a book called Moral Politics, and he's one, written one called The Political Mind, that I think is also a great textbook on magic and psychology is he talks about how words and metaphors actually get embedded in our neurological structures. Um, you know, we live in a world that's full of overarching metaphors that reflect differing values, and we tend to frame the world in terms of some of these deep stories that we've grown up with. Uh, so he talks about how, again, how to move people, you know, we can't just talk about statistics, we can't just talk about policies. Uh, we have to talk in ways that actually encourage people to come from their deepest values. And there are different metaphorical structures we hold 
You know, one of the reasons we have this divide in this country is we've got people who come from what he calls the strict father frame. That's this frame of like sin and punishment and you know the world is tough and we need a strong father at the head of the family and the country's like a family and you know you got to raise your kids with discipline and if they do wrong you got to punish them and uh, if you coddle them too much they'll be weak um, we all encounter that frame a lot right um, he talks about the other frame People come from what he calls the nurturing parent frame. Um, that nurturing isn't gender divided into male and female. And that the country, if the country is like a family, what a family is supposed to do is take care of each other and look out for each other and nurture each other and help each other fulfill themselves and reach their potential. And he looks at our divides around many of the different issues. We can look at our divide around climate change, you know, and you can see how in that strict father frame, it's really easy to blame the victim. I mean, you could see Trump doing that today. You know, he sent out a bunch of tweets about Puerto Rico that basically were implying like, you know, it's their fault that they're in a mess. <laughs> Um, it ignores the reality that misfortune comes to all of us in life at some point. You know, we all get sick and uh, you don't necessarily deserve the disease. You know, we all can trip and fall and break a leg and that's not a punishment. That's just an accident. And uh, you know, again, from the nurturing frame, um, part of what we need to do is take care of one another. And we need to spread it around when there's misfortune. So if we've got people right now in Puerto Rico and all over the Caribbean who are devastated from the hurricanes and from what we see is really is the result of climate change, then it's all of our responsibility to try to respond and try to help mitigate uh, and not to blame the victim. But Lakoff also says, you know, we all carry some of both of those frames, um, whether we're aware of it or not. You know, the most die-hard Republicans somewhere deep inside, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people came down to volunteer in New Orleans and contributed, uh, and a lot of them were Republicans, were not all like, um, us nice progressive bleeding heart liberal types. <laughs> um, and even us nice progressives often carry some of that sin punishment. You know, how many times have you heard some lovely spiritual new age person say, uh, I know a few years ago when I broke my ankle and went on that trip, how many people said to me, that's the goddess's way of telling you to slow down. <laughs> and I finally started like yelling at them and saying, no, if the goddess were my boyfriend and she broke my ankle to tell me to slow down, you'd be telling me to get out of that abusive relationship. <laughs> the goddess wants me to slow down she could just give me a million dollars and I wouldn't have to work anymore. <laughs> but I'm bringing this up because I think one of the, I think that frame creeps into the climate movement and the environmental movement. You know, that we are often uh, in, a, in a subtle way telling a story that's actually a story about sin and punishment. You know, when we frame climate change as, you know, it is you, your fault for your consumerism. Uh, it is your fault for, because you need to sacrifice. You need to, you know, you're wanting to actually read with electric light at midnight is part of the problem. <laughs> you know, uh, I think we actually unconsciously have fallen into that other frame, and I don't think it actually serves us. Because I think climate change, 
you know, one of the reasons it's hard to deal with it is it runs counter to this other frame that we all carry, which is the story of progress. The story that somehow we now have transcended nature's limits, you know, and there's, you know, you can look around and you can see so many ways in which we have. You know, I fly on an airplane and through the air, you know, I don't fall down. You know, I can pull out my iPhone and talk to someone on the other side of the world. You know, it's amazing, really. Um, but that makes us think that we should be able to transcend all of nature's limits. You know, if we admit that we don't, then in a very deep level, we have to actually admit that we are each mortal and we are each subject to die. If we admit that things happen to people that might not be their fault, uh, and that not, might not be a result of their actions, but might be just sheer bad luck or cumulative destruction of the system that support us, and that they might not deserve those fates, that's terrifying because then it opens up for each one of us that we might find ourselves in a situation where we don't deserve our fate and we lose control. So I think to deal with climate change, we need to find a story that speaks to our deepest values. Uh, we need to find a way to frame that, ways that can hold and support people in you know, actually acknowledging and coming to terms with nature's limitations and with the reality of death. Um, because the positive side of doing that is, again, if we go back to indigenous cultures, if we go back to the old goddess traditions from Europe and the Middle East, we go back to cultures that live connected to the earth, what they talk about are stories of cycles um, that say death and regeneration go together. Death is part of life and death leads on to decay. And there is no regeneration without death and decay. So if we try to avoid that, what we actually avoid doing is exactly what we need to do to renew the world. So that's my rant for the night. <laughs> but what I'd like you to do is take a moment right now, maybe just close your eyes, and think about what is sacred to you, in the sense of what you most deeply care about, and what's most important to you. You know, what is it you care about more than your own personal profit or convenience? What is it you care enough about you might take a stand for it or take a risk for it? What is it that actually nourishes you and sustains you? What I'd like you to do is find someone you haven't spoken with yet, maybe, and take a few minutes and try to imagine how you might speak in terms of that sacred value. How would you speak about our political work, about climate change, about any of the work you're involved in? How would you tell the story framed with your sacred value at its core? You know, I mean, one powerful example has been the way uh, the elders from Standing Rock spoke so clearly about their movement, um, not just stop the pipeline, but water is sacred, water is life. We are not just protesters, we are water defenders, water protectors. So how might you frame your sacred value uh, in those in terms? terms that can convey that and evoke that in somebody else.
So uh, I wonder if anyone has an example you'd like to share or uh, came up with a framework you'd like to share. Uh, Mary and I both and uh, what came immediately to mind before you uh, gave your example was water. Mm -hmm. and the water, the river that we both love. And um, how that can be uh, maybe a way to you know, relate to people, something more basic. Mm. The, the story is that everyone is broken hearted. Mm. All humans are broken hearted. And uh, I feel like that broken heartedness, that sadness is a very genuine human feeling and it connects us all. And that perhaps our human story is our interdependence. Thank you. I'm so glad I heard that. <laughs> I really feel that that's very powerful. To piggyback on that comment, the broken heart is the open heart. Mm. And we all have that. So the more broken we are, the more open we are. Um, I want to share my core values of love, beauty, and um, love, beauty, and joy. When I convey and when I speak or communicate, it's really from my heart. And what is there that's more joyous and beautiful than this beautiful earth? Mm -hmm. And getting leafed on, which we will be soon. Thank you. So, the gentleman that I was speaking with brought up the point that um, if we don't have compassion when we're speaking to other people with differing views, it's never going to get across. For mm -hmm. example, um, we talk about coal miners who, that's their livelihood, and it may seem antiquated and outdated to us, but to them, if they're not having their basic needs met, they can't think beyond that. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to echo on the uh, open heart, broken heart piece. I, I think one of the things that those that experienced Standing Rock experience was that up was the idea of the story that, you know, elders had a vision. They had to bring people together that had been disenfranchised by leadership in the tribe. They had to bring people back in, you know, from all walks and all trails, twin spirits. And I think this is really the key to what the woman was speaking to earlier about healing the heart. How do we get this movement to coalesce if people are stuck in their own pain or in their own angst? And I know that there's a great effort by Geo to keep that angst out there. Mm -hmm. And I think people have to work with an energy equal to that, you know, to operate in a compassionate way. Mm -hmm. I saw law enforcement standing on Turtle Island, desecrating graves. And I felt like screaming at them, you know, hey, want me to go to Michigan? Mm -hmm. Stand on your grandparents' grave. And yet an elder put his hand on my shoulder and said, that's not what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. And I want you to come back to this place and sing the song tonight when you're drawing. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think that really was a process for me. It was recognizing the implicit bias that I had. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is open -minded. It has to be open mm -hmm. And I think this movement will grow if people are able to reach out to each other and do the healing for us. Mm -hmm. We'll be unstoppable. Mm -hmm. There's a hand behind you. One of the reasons why indigenous people love storytelling so much is because it brings forth a visual, verbal, a connected image of those core values of the community. Mm -hmm. And one of the powerful things about storytelling is that it has the ability to either liberate people, like what the Buddha did with his storytelling, um, or what Hitler did with his sword mm -hmm. and imprisoned people into fear. So if we learn how to tell our stories mm -hmm. in a way that brings forth the connected values that bind us together, we will find that liberation. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
work as our mother. And just looking at your talisman and the healthy groups up there, just thinking about how all these elements influence our ability to actually do something, effectiveness. And um, someone else speaking about um, you know, being in the heart and stuck in the heart, that to me is about fire and passion and it's trapped with a lot of people because they can't move out of their own pain. And then he's speaking about um, the, you know, storytelling, which is the arrow. And, and to me, it, it seems like there's a lot of people that are stuck, but would, uh, there's a wholeness to everyone's really caring about the earth as our mother. And it's a matter of really good to go to elements to uh, find a connection through communication, which is like about water and trust. And um, what was, uh, just to share a personal thought, I had an acupuncture session today where the acupuncture person identified that I was very stuck in my heart and did these things on my meridians to move that down into my kidneys <laughs> so I could actually be not quite so stuck and be able to move again. So, um, I just thought I was reflecting on that a lot today and then you know, just to hear all these people talking about elements and, and just having that reminder up there, it, it really is a great uh, thing because those are just such basic concepts that we can relate to and, and move with. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a quick thing. Uh, I feel that uh, Kathy and I were talking about uh, there's a lot of disconnect each other, humans and other animal species, and the, and the disconnect from the earth, and how we're disconnected from the fact that we are the earth, and if we do something to the earth, we're going to ourselves and to people around the globe, you know, just to burn trash and think it's, it goes away, it doesn't. So I feel like that disconnect is really powerful in and we have to do whatever we can that doesn't mimic like capitalism. You know, we need to cooperate with the earth and mimic natural systems that empower people who want to like care about the earth. And because then they wouldn't do things. Like I think our neighbor wouldn't want to put in a gravel pit and the town would put another gravel pit on the other side of our farm if they cared. They would think about some different way to do it. So I think those types of things will help us be in one. Thank you. And maybe we'll take one more. I see one hand there. Hi, thank you. So, you asked what we can say for you. I certainly came out and I have children. I may someday have grandchildren. I think a lot of us have really been very lucky in where we've grown up in that, you know, most of us have had access to fresh water and I think we are at the tipping point at this time of history when I see, you know, record high temperatures in Vermont in September. This, these last few days are the hottest days we've had all summer, literally. <laughs> and it's, it's very strange, you know, we say so well, it's kind of a long time thing, but we all know it's not. And it is a very real possibility that our grandchildren and their children won't have the benefit of a modern climate and fresh air and fresh water. And we can talk about conservation and at the same time there is the reality that the global population is growing and growing really fast. And those people who are coming to work out, they want that energy, and they want the cars, and they want the electricity, we all want those things. We all want the internet. And you can blame us, and you can blame us, because these things are wonderful. And somehow, somewhere, what I hope is that we can find a balance, that we can find a way to say, these are the things that work, that make our life better, and can make the world better. Make well, I have lived in the, in the southern end of the Appalachians. We are in the northern end of the Appalachians. The southern end of the Appalachians has been destroyed, literally 
destroyed. We have melted our island because people want coal, because people want electricity. And I understand the desire for those things. I want them too. And yet, we've got to find a way. And I don't know what the answer is. I hope that collectively we can come up with answers. I do know that the governor has appointed the Commission on Climate Change, and they are looking for input. So if you have any brilliant ideas, feel free to get in touch with them. And, um, and that is what I think is here for this time. Is finding that balance for all of us and for the people that we love. Thank you. And for the people they love. So, um, you know, we're getting down towards the end of our time together. I want to leave some time for people just to ask questions, but I do want to say I think we are stronger when we speak in terms of our sacred values. And um, when we tell a story, you know, oftentimes I feel like in the environmental mental movement, we're telling people a story that basically goes, things are worse than you thought, and it's probably your fault. And really, the world would be better off without humans. And that's not, first of all, that's not a story you can mobilize anyone around. <laughs> Secondly, I don't think it's true. I don't think the world would be better off without humans. I think that Mother Earth, Gaia, went to a huge amount of trouble to evolve human consciousness over billions of years. And it would be really a waste to throw it away right now. Uh, that we're here for a reason and we have uh, something we're supposed to be doing with this consciousness. So I think we need to be telling people a different story. We need to be telling people the story that this is a time of the great brokenness. Broken heartedness, broken systems on every, every level. But that is the death and the decay that calls us to the great regeneration and the great work of healing, and that we are all here right now to do that work. We each have our own unique gifts and talents and calling to our own unique part of that work. And the wonderful thing about that work is, you know, if we frame climate change not just as carbon numbers, but as massive environmental brokenness, then the answer to it is, massive environmental regeneration on a global scale. And the good news is we know how to do that. We actually have tremendous tools for doing that. We can point out incidences, you know, there's a man named Tony Ronaldo who discovered how to regenerate forests on the Sahel and uh, basically by looking around and going, oh, you know, he'd been working with an international organization to plant trees for 20 years that planted trees and planted trees and planted trees and they all died. And then one day he was looking at the ground so discouraged he was ready to give up. He looked around and he went, oh, the trees are already here. They're here in the form of these little bitten off shrubs, you know, that goats have been nibbling at, but they're here. And instead he shifted and started to teach people to prune those trees and fence those trees and suddenly they had trees and they had forests and they had firewood and they had mitigation and they have reforested tens of millions of hectares now in Niger and Mali and Ethiopia and in countries where instead of the desert increasing, the desert is retreating. You know, we, I could give you 10 examples of that. We have the tools for massive environmental regeneration. And it comes down to working with nature, uh, regenerating soil, which helps us regenerate the water cycles, um, using plants, using Mother Nature's methods to take carbon out of the atmosphere and turn that carbon into humans and into soil fertility and into trees and into plant bodies. Uh, we need to stop pumping carbon into the atmosphere, but we don't have an energy crisis on this planet. We have abundant energy on this planet. We have more energy flowing into this planet every day from the sun than we could possibly use. <laughs> what we have is a crisis of 
organization and management and what we have to sacrifice is not our ability to have a good life and not the ability of someone in the third world to eventually be able to enjoy some of the benefits that we have enjoyed. What we have to sacrifice really is the ability of the oil companies and a few others to make massive profits from destroying the earth and the rest of us. You know. <laughs> So I think we need to frame it in a way that invites people in and that acknowledges again that we each do have a role to play. You are an important part of making this transition and um, that role isn't going to be the same for each one of us. You know, change is an ecosystem that has a wide variety of niches and maybe someone's niche is going to be stopping that pipeline and standing in front of the riot cops and chaining themselves to the bulldozer, but that's not the only niche or the most important niche. You know, maybe your niche is writing your legislator or running for office in your local town or teaching people the tools and the skills they need to respond to emergencies. Uh, or teaching children about environmental education, or making media that helps, you know, support all of this, or helping to raise funds uh, to provide for all of this. Um, if we think in those terms, then we don't have to get into these stupid arguments about, like, why aren't you doing my tactic? Instead, what we can be doing is saying, well, how does your niche support my niche? How can we better integrate them and use them to create really powerful systems of change. So I want to just stop with one little last story. Uh, you know, I was at Standing Rock just for a very short period of time and it was incredibly inspiring. And it was also incredibly hard when Trump basically said, put the pipeline through, who cares? Um, but I was in Germany earlier this year and our translator was talking about how in her little community in Germany, everybody had organized to do support for Standing Rock. And then one day they looked around and they said, well, yes, we're doing support for Standing Rock for the water protectors, but maybe we should be water protectors too. Uh, maybe we should be looking at our own rivers and saying if water is sacred, our waters are sacred. And they formed a group they called the River Keepers, and suddenly they had a group in their own area taking responsibility for cleaning up their rivers and caring for guarding their rivers. And to me, that's an example of the power of political change. You don't always see it. You know, there's probably been no like headlines or no like you know viral Facebook posts about the River Keepers in her little area. But think of like, if that's one story, there's hundreds of those stories. And if that action sparked that change, think of the hundreds and thousands of people that have been changed, again, because that action spoke so powerfully in terms of those sacred values. And that's how we begin to make change in the world. So I want to... We've got a little bit of time. I want to just open it up if people have questions or they have things you want to organize around, maybe to let people know. Uh, and just to ask, please keep your remarks concise if you can. Hi, thank you so much, Star. Uh, I just wanted to let you all know really briefly about something that's giving me a great deal of personal relief as an organizer. Uh, the Poor People's Campaign, which is a campaign that Martin Luther King started two weeks before he died in 1968, uh, has been revived by Dr. William Barber and um, Liz Theo Harris. And at 5.30 on Saturday, we're going to be doing our first act of civil disobedience, a very, not civil disobedience, just First Amendment rights exercise at Montpelier Park, where we announced the Poor People's Campaign in Vermont. Um, the next day, on Sunday at 5.30, we're going to be getting together at the Vermont Workers Center in Burlington, at the very old labor hall in Barrie, and probably at the Root Center in Brattleboro to discuss our plans for uniting so many of our efforts into a part of this campaign that is really going to launch 
in 40 days of civil disobedience at state capitals all over this country trying to confront systematic racism, systematic poverty. Um, we start this Sunday with the, with the ecological devastation agenda. Please come hang out with us at 530 at the burial of the hall. I think that you might feel as relieved as I do. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And again, other questions or, uh, yeah. Here we go, Stacey. Um, I'm a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, and we have a Burlington chapter, and we advocate for a revenue neutral carbon tax, and we have um, some fun doing it. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, we're welcoming new members to show. Thank you. I'll also just say, while that microphone is going around, being in southern Germany was very inspiring. Being in a place where every old farmhouse had solar panels on it, and there were solar farms everywhere and wind farms everywhere. And the reason is Germany has policies that support that and that pay people for that. And they're making 30 to 50% or more of their energy from electricity right now. And Germany isn't exactly like your sunniest country in the world. Right? <laughs> so, you know, Denmark is moving to 100% renewable energy. Uh, France is phasing out fossil fuels. You know, other countries are far ahead of us on this. And it can be done. It really, uh, there is no technological, uh, no scientific, no constraint on making that shift. And making that shift is only going to make the world cleaner and healthier in so many ways. Oh, yeah. OK. I want to point out something. There is a four-week course starting at the Union Center tomorrow night uh, in Waterbury. And the title of the course is How to Become an Effective Agent of Change. And I've been going to the Waterbury Union Center for 12 years. And there's a lot of good that's come out of it. And I think that Thank you. This is so wrong. I appreciate, appreciate you speaking to the sort of self-hatred that can be in the environmental movement of the community that shouldn't exist. Um, and reading who we write in the past has really healed some of that for me. I'm, after spending a lot of time at Sandy Rock this past year, I'm really fired up about decolonization. And I have kind of a similar feeling about that sometimes. I'm like, oh, settler people should leave this home with America. We should just go, I don't know, to Mars, or where should we go? What can we do out here? Um, so I just wonder if you have any insights about how to do decolonization work in a way that's like embracing of our own needs as well. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the messages I got at Standing Rock, um, both first in prayer, and then uh, from an amazing woman named Lila June, who led a women's sweat when I was there, is that European people need to understand, people who have European heritage need to understand, we also have indigenous roots. Um, they're just further back, and there's a, a big barrier between us and connecting with them, that is the witch persecutions and all the things that went on with the rise of capitalism. You know, that doesn't absolve us from dealing with the actual real privilege of having white skin and the differentiations. But if we can understand that this deep desire and urge to connect to the earth and link to the earth is something that's a human heritage that we all have. I also think that, um, you know, so we need to kind of learn about those roots and also learn, and if I had more time, I'd go into the whole thing, but it takes a little time to lay it all out. <laughs> so, um, I also think that we need to think about heritage in a slightly broader way. Um, you know, I think there's a danger in defining heritage strictly as bloodline. Um, though it certainly doesn't mean you should be claiming a heritage you don't actually have. But anyone who speaks a European language, anyone for whom that's how you live and work and think, has a European heritage. 
Um, anyone who lives and works in this culture, you know, has this culture as a heritage. We can't avoid it. It is part of what it shapes us, makes us who we are. Um, heritage is not just your bloodline or your ancestors. Even, you know, Native Americans will say again, no, you can't just go set up a sweat lodge in a hotel somewhere and charge money for it because you decide you want to be a spiritual teacher. Um, that's colonization, that's appropriation. But if you actually are called to the sweat lodge, then what you do is you go to someone who can teach you and you offer service, you give something back, you do the training, you put, pay your dues, and if that person is willing to teach you over time, then you can learn that tradition. And that's how you earn the right to practice that tradition. Um, I also, many years ago when we were talking about this, and way back in the 90s in our cult community, I sort of said, okay, I've got to go meditate on this, and I've got to go talk to the ancestors, you know, talk to the ancestors and say, what do you think about all of this? And what I heard from the ancestors was they said, we don't actually care that much who your ancestors were. What we care about is what you're doing for the children. So for me, I think about that. If I have a commitment to the future of a people in some way, uh, if I have a commitment to their children, to creating a world for their children, then I have actually have a responsibility to learn something and know something about their tradition and their heritage. Again, that doesn't give me the right to set myself up as an authority on it unless I've gone through the training and learned that and gained that. Um, but it does give me the right to open to it and to learn from it. Uh, and I think we have to beware of the bloodline thing because it leads us into a world then in which like you might have to prove you're white to play the piano. <laughs> and we don't want to go there or Italian, whatever. You know, we have really tried hard uh, and there we have a thousands of years of heritage of people struggling against a world that says you should be limited by who your parents were, your ancestors were, and that should determine and limit what you opportunities are. We don't want to go there. We want to go to a world where you have the opportunity to fairly earn the things that you are drawn to and that you are attracted to. And you do that by giving back, by committing to the reality of a people, not just a romanticized vision of it, um, and by offering service and paying your dues. Yeah. I'm wondering if there are any songs or chants that feel particularly potent, right? Any what? Songs. Songs. Any okay, songs. Um, would you like to sing one? Yes, please. This one is very simple words. It goes, no army can hold back a thought, no fence can chain the sea. The earth cannot be sold or bought, all life shall be free. And uh, it has a wordless chorus. You can just hum along if you don't want the words. It just goes, hey, oh, oh.
shall be free. No army can hold back a thought. No things can change the sea. The earth cannot be sold or bought. All I shall be free. No army can hold back a thought. No things can change the sea. The earth can So you can find it all at my website, which is starhawk.org, or on our earthactivisttraining.org website. Uh, I also have, I don't know if we still have some books downstairs, but we might have a few left for sale. And uh, there is some food down there. Um, the Fifth Sacred Thing, which is my novel, is now available as an audio book as well. You can get that online. And, uh, we had a few copies of City of Refuge, which is the sequel. So again, thank you all for coming out. And uh, when is the movie come out? Um, it's probably going to be a TV series rather than a movie, and that still remains to be seen. So uh, it's moving ahead, but it isn't yet at the point where I can give you a date for it. Great, thank you all.